to go back to Exodus chapter 32 for a couple of minutes. If you've got a Bible, Exodus chapter 32, because in talking about God's knowledge that he is all knowing, we seem to run into a bit of a problem when we look at Exodus 32. And this is a painting, of course, of the golden calf, as you can see here. Moses has gone up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. He stays up there a bit too long. And before you know it, the Israelites have made an idol for themselves and they're worshiping these, this golden calf. And it's hard to see in this overhead here, but all the way on the left, uh, in a brighter lamp, you could see it. But Moses is coming down the mountain and he's got the tablets over his head like he's about to throw, them that, uh, throw these tablets at them. You know, when Charlton Heston did that, it, they, they broke everywhere. Anyway, in any event, God really wanted to punish Israel for this. And he says he's going to punish Israel for this. But then Moses intercedes for Israel. And here's what he says. Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. O Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, Moses says to God. He then goes on to say, relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them. It will be their inheritance forever. So he's reminding God of what God had promised to Abraham back in, uh, back in Genesis 12 and Genesis 15. He's saying, you, you said you were going to promise all this to Abraham, and now you're going to wipe it all out. And then it says, then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Now, wait, 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 wait. God is supposed to be all knowing, right? He's supposed to know all these things. And Moses gives him new information or reminds him of old information and he changes his mind, it seems, right? How can this be? How can God be all-knowing and, by the way, unchangeable, yet here he gets new information and he changes? So what do we have to say about this? How can, how can this be? Well, this is what we're going to cover tonight. First thing we're going to talk about is what is God's omniscience and the biblical basis for it? Because as we'll see as we get into this, the Bible clearly teaches that God is all-knowing. He knows all these things. It also teaches, by the way, he's unchangeable. Yet here God gets new information and he changes. So how can that be? In fact, the second part of this, we're going to talk about these objections. If God knows everything, then why does he appear to change in the Bible? And why should we pray, by the way, if he knows everything? Right? What's the point? And do we really have free will if he knows everything? I mean, if he knows I'm going to do this, did I really freely do it? He knew it from all eternity that I would do this. He knew from all eternity you'd be here. So do you have free will? He knew from all eternity who would be saved and who wouldn't be saved. So do you really have free will? Or are we just elect? He elects some people to salvation and others he doesn't, and you really have no free choice. And... By the way, do we even need any of this anyway? Won't we know everything through science someday? I mean, doesn't science continually progress and we get better and better and we get to know more and more and we can prove our lives more and more? We don't even need this God guy anyway, right? I mean, that's kind of the, the uh, zeitgeist, if you will. That's kind of the, the way of the day, the way of the age, that science is everything and we don't need God anyway. Then we're going to talk about how should we live in, lights of God's om in light of God's omniscience. How should we live if God really is all-knowing and if he is infinite in his knowledge and these other attributes. In fact, I want to pause here and point out something about God's attributes. You'll notice that these attributes are all interrelated. In fact, we perceive individual attributes of God like a beam of light going through a prism, right? We get all these attributes out of this. These aren't all of his attributes, but here's some of them. His omniscience, his love, immutability. In other words, he doesn't change. His holiness, his power, his knowledge, his justice, and several other attributes. And we perceive them and we talk about them individually, but in reality, God's attributes are unified in his being. All these attributes are together, coexistent, co-equal, in God, in one simple, unchangeable, infinite being. 
So while we talk about these as being set separate attributes, in reality, they're all together. All these attributes are together in God at the same time. And as we'll see later in today's culture, which one of these attributes do we tend to magnify and which one of these attributes do we tend to minimize or deny? Which one do we magnify? Love. We magnify love and what do we minimize? Yeah, holiness or justice. We, we minimize those. We don't want those. We just want God to be love which means he never punishes anybody, he never says no, he basically is the cosmic candy man, whatever we want, we get, right? But if God is God, you can't maximize one and minimize another. They all come together. This is not a cafeteria God. 